and welcome to this tutorial on population genomics in R. I'm Sarah Martin. I'm a research scientist at Agriculture Canada in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I've been using R for about 15 years to analyze and display my data. And it's been quite a rewarding experience. I love to learn how to program because it's, it's little puzzles that you can solve on a daily basis. So you can feel like you're making real progress. Uh, today, the workshop that I put together, I compiled from a number of different sources. However, the main source that I've used is the Grunwald Labs text. And here, I'll just start sharing my screen here. I can give you a, I can show you that. All right, can you see that screen now? So the Grunwald Lab, yeah, uh, great, perfect, thank you. The Grunwald Lab has put together a lot of information. They're the people who have developed a lot of the packages that we're gonna be using, or I'll be showing you today, uh, including this uh, website on population genetics and genomics in R. And these tutorials are wonderful, and I strongly encourage you to take a look at these if this is the type of analysis that you're going to be doing. Uh, other sources that I've used uh, include uh, other sources online for tutorials and vignettes for all these packages. And I do have a list of the sources that I've used to compile the information in the, in the code, which I hope that I'm gonna be able to share with you as well. Before we get started, because we're not all working together in uh, our studio today, uh, I thought I would just briefly touch on how I use R so that you can have an idea of what kind of options are available to you as you start or you continue to uh, work in R. So I use a program called Notepad++. Uh, this is a, a free uh, type of software that is uh, good for almost any language. So you can see here, I co write all my code in this window. I like it because it colors up the code with different colors for different things. So much it makes it much more readable for parsing for me than for our studio. Uh, I also have a plugin for this that usually works when I'm not casting where it will just send text from Notepad++ to my R GUI with a press of F8, which makes it easy to integrate with R. And because you have R open in a larger window, and if you have two monitors at work, uh, you can have one in each window and you can get a big screen showing uh, your plots instead of a little tiny R Studio plot. I also like uh, that you can uh, compress material in your thing with the curly brackets. So if you have a, a larger section, you can compress it to make it easy to go through your code and find the code that you want uh, more easily without scrolling through a lot of extra material. Uh, finally, I like being able to put these little dots. I don't, that's kind of fun. Just it, you can see where you are in your code by highlighting with the dots. So those are the features that I particularly enjoy about Notepad++. It also has uh, support for multiple language. So if you're gonna be working in Python or Perl, or doing shell scripts, it, it colors those as well. So it's a nice integrated solution for bioinformatics type programming work. The other thing that I do uh, with R, I, I've developed a template to help me document uh, my code and uh, keep track of what I have done. So for example, here's a blank template version that I have. And it starts out with a program description area, which talks about, I used to talk about what were the goals of this project? What were the outcomes that I was expecting? And this way, if I go away from project and then come back, I can bring myself more quickly up to speed. I have a place for the change log, which I use to document uh, what I dealt with in terms of dealing or developing the code. And then uh, what problems maybe I still have to solve or what things I've tried. And again, this will help bring me up to speed to say, well, where was I with this code? Uh, what were some of the problems that I solved and why, why did I do some things in particular ways? The other thing that I, I would like to draw your attention to is this command here, the dev session, uh, dev tool session info command. This prints out all the information about your R version and what you were using and then all the package versions here. So you can see that, that big list. And this can also be helpful if down the road you come back to your program and maybe R has been updated, the packages have been updated, there could be things that have changed under the hood that you don't know about. And maybe you get a different answer when you run your analysis and you're, maybe you're revising your paper and you're like, what has happened? Well, how can I isolate what has happened? And so in order to eliminate, well, was it a package change? Did the developers find an error in the package and then change it and upload that? 
this is the information that you're going to need for that. So it's good to save that session info for when you submit your paper to the journal after you finish your analysis or at some point so that you have that on file. Now, I know that this can be a really hard sell for busy researchers and scientists and students who are all under pressure to get things done uh, as fast as possible. And you might think, I'll remember, it'll be fine. But uh, you can take it from me from experience that especially if you have to step away from a project for a time or you have a longer running project, you will save time by documenting now when your head is in the space of the program uh, in comparison to the time it would take you to come back and figure out what you have done if you haven't documented your code. So as you probably saw in the description for this workshop today, uh, I thought the four big areas to cover to help bring you up to speed as an introduction would be to talk about how we import data into R and how we convert it into the types of objects that R can use to do the analyses. And then also talk to you about how, how you understand that data because sometimes you import it and then you're like, well, okay, that's great, but what did you import and how do I interact with that? Uh, I will show you how to do some basic population uh, statistics. I will show you how to produce and display a PCA and a DPCA. And then I will help you to see how you would produce a neighbor joining tree or a, a UPGMA tree. Okay. So here I set my paths so it can easily change if I go between a work computer or the cluster. Here I will set my, my date string. So it's a little bit of a complicated, uh, complicated statement, but it helps to, uh, uh, it helps to set your date to the current date and you can just use it as a variable when you're producing files. That way you know when you produce the file and if you dynamically do that, uh, it's a lot easier than having to remember to rename your file every time. Okay. So one type of file that is frequently produced by uh, genomic pipelines, phylogenetic pipelines, is a variant call file. Now the contents of a variant call file will differ from place to place. And this makes it a little bit difficult to get into R. But luckily, the Grunwald Lab, who I talked about before, has been here before. And they have produced a package called BCF to R to help you do that. And I have a link to where they describe this package in the code here. Uh, so to use that package, we simply load the data that they have for an example, and then we see, well, what, what is that? So there it says, okay, I brought in this VCFR thing uh, object. It's got 18 samples. There's one chromosome or one contig. You could think of that if you're not on a chromosome. And there's this many variants and there's 8.5% missing data overall. Great. So it brought it in, that's a good sign. But now what, how do I interact with this this object. I mean, there's a lot of things that won't work, right? Like what, what are the names here? Like what are the names of the, the, uh, the things that I can interact here? And I'll just say, nah, that's not true. There's nothing under, under that thing. So we can use this more high power command, which is called structure. And what it prints out is gonna be maybe a little bit gobbledygook the first couple times you, you look at it, but this tells you exactly how this data object is structured. And what you want to look for is either a dollar sign or an at symbol. And that tells you sort of the partitions within this object. So here we see that there are three sections to the file. There's a meta data file or meta data column. It's a single row of data. There's a fixed table of data and there's a genotype or GT table, right? And so in VCFR, they, are, they have the documentation to tell you which, what each of these things means, but but that's, uh, if you, once you've read it, you understand. So, but that's fine. But how do I start accessing these things? Well, if with the at symbol or the dollar sign symbol, you can access those particular things. So here we can look at the, the first few lines, five by default of the metadata, and it'll print out. Uh, we could set that to Sorry 10 for if we the wanted. interruption. Is there any chance you could make a larger font so people in the room could see a little better? Is it not big enough? That's, I've had a few requests from the audience. Okay. How about that? Making it a little easier to see. I don't know if I can do that here. Let's okay. See. Hmm.
I don't know that I can do it in the R window. Is it completely impossible to see? It's fine for me. Well, so all I can say is that if, if you can't see it here, um, I hope that you will be able to get this code. We can distribute this code to you and you can work through it. It should all be commented in the code so that you can follow along if you were listening here and if you go maybe back to the recording of this session, Thank you. Uh, perhaps you'll be able to go through and understand uh, a little bit more closely what I talked about um, based on what you can generate yourself in R. Um, I don't know, that's about all I can do for the moment. So uh, an alternative way to access the data in these uh, partitions would be to use the square bracket format. So this would be the equivalent of the head. You get the first five lines of, of that particular thing. Uh, you can also check its length. So you could decide whether or not you wanted to print the whole thing if it's you know, 10,000 lines or if it's 29 lines, it's a little bit different. Um, and that would allow you to just say, okay, well, just give it to me all here, okay? You could also then uh, look at the tail, which is the end of the thing. If you if you wanted to look at the tail and not the, the beginning, that would be the uh, an alternative. So there's many different ways to access the particular pieces of this puzzle. Uh, another way that you can do if you want to uh, find something in particular, like if you want to say, well, where is mapping quality mentioned in this metadata? You can ask it using grep and that has the the pattern of what am I looking for and where am I going to look for it? So if we do that, it'll return and say, uh, it'll give us a numeric vector and we can pass that then back and say, okay, show me the lines that correspond to those numeric vectors. And then you can say, okay, this says mapping quality one, 225 with filtering, mapping quality, mapping quality, mapping quality. So that's how you can retrieve particular pieces of information within the metadata or elsewhere uh, that you need to. Uh, VCF unlike uh, is nice in that it has some actual specific commands that have been developed for querying different portions of it. So it's a little bit more developed and a little bit more user friendly than many of the other packages you might deal with. And so they actually have a command here that's called query metadata. So you can get the same sort of information a little bit more easily using their out of the box um, commands here. So here it tells you what exactly you have in that metadata file. And you can also, if you wanted to look for map quality, you can pass that command very specifically. I want to look for the metadata, uh, the uh, mapping quality uh, thing in your metadata. Okay, so then again, from the structure, we know uh, that the second set of data in there, the fixed column was a table. So for a table, we can always ask it what the column names are. So what is in there? And then we can pretty much guess what that is, right? Chromosome position, reference alternative in terms of the SNPs, right? And in this case here, we can try uh, a command that is frequently used to be able to summarize your data, which is summary, it often will work here. It does not, however, because, uh, oh wait, yeah, it doesn't, because you have here, it's everything is stored as characters within this array. So it just tells you yet yeah, there's 2,533 2, things in each of these buckets and they're all characters. So that's not particularly helpful if you want to understand what the quality scores look like. So what you have to do if you get this type of, of, of issue is to convert those characters into numeric scores. So here we go, we can convert that into a numeric for the, the mapping quality in column six. And we can get a readout of what that summary of that is. We could box plot that. So here we go, there's a box plot, you can get it, a, the idea of the distribution of your data and maybe an idea of maybe there's an outlier or something going on there. You could alternatively, you could do a histogram. So these are fairly easy peasy, right? But not particularly pretty. So you might say to me, well, that's fine, but I'm not gonna win any points for beautiful graphics with that. Uh, is there a better way? Well, is there a fancier way? Well, there is. Uh, here, if you have um, a VCF file and a FASTA file and a GFF file, so your genomic feature file for the same data, you can use a package called Chrome R, which has some uh, fun ways to visualize your data and explore better the quality of it. So here we'll load those. And this actually takes a minute. So I've already run it before the session here. So here, 
So now we get some histograms. We get more histograms in the plot. They're colored, so that's a little bit better, but uh, that's not really gonna impress a committee member or anything, is it? So what else? Is there something that's fancier even than that? Well, with R, there's always something fancier. And here is your option for that. Let's make that draw bigger. So here you can see this is more of a sophisticated graphic that has been put into R. You have your read depth across the, the length of the FASTA, you have your mapping quality, your FRED scores, your number of variants, the nucleotide con uh, content, and then from your GFF file, you have where the annotations are. So here you can see this is a much more sophisticated way to sort of get a, a good picture of, of your data if you have the components for that. So if you wanted to try that out on your own data and get a good sense of uh, what you're looking at, uh, there's more details in the vignettes for BCFR. Now packages in R such as Popper and Adigenet use a data structure called a gen ID. A VCF can be converted into a gen ID uh, using VCF to gen ID from, from a VCF, using VCFR. So let's do that with our data and convert it into a, uh, a gen ID. Now, gen IDs are good for small data sets. So they're not for uh, large SNP data sets. For that, you need to use a gen light object. So there's the command for the gen light, and it has the ability to be passed the command to use multiple cores. And so if you have a multi-threaded environment where you can do that, that can help. There is also two other data structures that sort of parallel this. There's the gen clone, which does uh, similar to a gen end or gen individual data structure, but they have a slot from representing a multi locus genotype. So if you're working with a species that tillers or that clones, that might be the more appropriate uh, data structure for you. And then SNP clone would be the gen light equivalent for the gen clone object, if you follow me. So that is the extension of the gen clone, but for a larger amount of data for SNPs. All right, so that sort of covers the basics of how you would bring a piece of data in and how you might uh, start to interrogate it, see if it has brought in all the correct information, what information is there, and uh, also then check to see some maybe some quality metrics and understand what your data looks like and then convert it into an object that you can then do further analysis with. Now, I want to pause this for a moment and just say, is there any any questions uh, ba based on that? I'm sorry if you can't see, but uh, let me know if there's any questions. I don't think so. No, going once, going twice. Okay, we'll move on to the next section then on uh, basic population statistics. So for this section, uh, we're gonna switch the data set to uh, the data microbove set. This is a set of microsatellite data from cows. Uh, again, we could do this with SNPs, it's just that for the processing times that we have uh, here, I felt it would be better to use a smaller object. So in this case, we can get a summary of this data using the summary command. And this will tell us a sort of basic information, like how many individuals are in this object, how many of, uh, are in each group that are being listed and number of alleles, heterozygosity. There's a little bit more information than we get when we initially bring in a VCR, a VCF, VCFR object. Um, and here you can see there's a little bit more information in this table about how you might access each of these things with the at symbol. We can also summarize things by information in this other or optional category. And it will tell us, okay, there's two different countries, Africa and France, there's 15 different breeds of cow here, and there's two different species of cow. We can also then get a locus specific summary table from that data as well. So you get some ideas about the evenness of these alleles and other parameters such as that. And you can do that by population as well. Oh, this is the missing data, sorry. So this is missing data. So this will tell you how much data is, is 
missing across your populations and across um, each of the loci. And it gives you a nice heat map to show where the blue shows you that there's not that much missing data. And in the red, there is a lot of missing data. So again, this can be a quick way to uh, check to see what kind of uh, missing, what data is missing across the landscape of your data. You can also then use Popper to filter that data and take out a certain amount of the data that is missing. So for example, here we can just test and see what is it gonna say about what it's gonna bring out. And it's gonna say, well, there's two loci that are missing greater than 5% of the data. And you can set, that's the default for this command, but you could set it to whatever you like. So if you felt that you wanted to make it more or less uh, stringent, then you can do that there. Then we can apply that to our data set and remove those two low size. Now you probably want to do more filtering and more exploration of your data if you were actually doing it, but uh, that just gives you an idea of, of how you would start that process and what packages you might want to look at. So once you've done that and you're happy with your data, you could move on to doing uh, individual calculations or overall calculations for the population parameters. Uh, there's many different ways in R to calculate things and many different packages that have uh, functions for calculating these things. And it all depends on what works and what seems to be calculating it in the way you want it to. So for example, Adigenet has, um, Adigenet has uh, ways of calculating within population heterozygosity. So you can just do that quite simply. They also have a genetic distance calculation that's easy to apply to your data and will produce a um, the lower half of the matrix here, and it defaults to, you can look at the code uh, or at the manual to see what the default is here. It's the Cavelli, Sforza, and Edwards chord distance that it defaults to. Uh, there are also path, uh, functions like in like Popper, uh, which will give you more of an, a general overview of your data. So if you want to get a bunch of different statistics all at once, then that can be a good, op a good option. Here it will tell you, you know, how many individuals were in each of these things, you know, what, what is the evenness, what's the lambda. You know, there's a plethora of data that you can extract from these. Uh, higher fstat is also another package that can provide very nice summaries. Uh, but for that, we need to make a higher fstat object. So we can do that using a gen ID to higher fstat function. And then we can run that command here as well and see what it gives us. So it gives us observed and expected heterozygosity. It gives us an FST, it gives us FIS. Uh, that's great. It gives it to us overall as well as per locus. Um, but this is where the question might come up, well, how did it calculate that? What FST is that? You know, your committee or your reviewer might say, what, like, what, what exactly did you do? Because there's many different ways of calculating FST and you need to be able to, to get at that. So the first way that you could do that is of course, to just type in help. And if you've been through the introduction to our course, imagine that you covered that. So that can be your first stop. And then you probably saw then in our studio, it comes up nicely in the tab. If you're here, it will launch your, um, your browser and bring up the manual page and show you, yes, this is, this is it. You can also get to this manual page often by typing in um, the package name and that you want the manual from CRAN and then going to that, that location and seeing, and here you can see the, the package page on CRAN, which will have the manual and it will also have any vignettes. So if you can't find the information that you're looking for on how the calculation was done in the information that's shown on the help or in the manual, then try the vignettes as the next, the next place to look. Now, if those two both strike out because the documentation on the particular package that you're looking at is particularly poor or you, you don't understand or you want to know for sure what exactly is it doing because you think something's wrong and you want to, to verify, uh, the thing you can do is actually just write in the command. Uh, in most cases, this will display the actual code that is being run on your data when you run that function. So this is a little bit harder level of stuff to understand what's going on because you need to be able to parse this, which means what you should do is set these variables, 
copy this into your into your window, set up the variables to what you want for your data, and then step through it step by step and see what is it doing at each step, what are the variables that it's producing, and then look at how it calculates your numbers. So if you need to track down something, this is um, an option for you. And indeed, we can see here in, in the information, just like in the manual, it tells us that it's calculating FST as DST over HT. And then you can go your way backwards through the code and say, well, okay, here's where DST is calculated and here's where HST, HT is calculated and so forth. So you can work your way back through the code or forward through the code to find what exactly is it doing. As I said, that can be important in some circumstances. So now if you wanted a record of the calculations that you have, maybe you want to make a table for your for your, your paper or you want to have something to print out, then we can use the command write a, a CSV. Now, the object that, that higher FSTAT has produced has multiple pieces, so you can't just call the whole thing. So here we're going to call just on the observed heterozygosity and write that to a CSV. And it's simple as that. And here, this is what it looks like in the end. You have your loci and your populations, and then your observed heterozygosity. Now, if you wanted to know what else you could do, you could use the, the, the power command here structure like we did at the beginning here and say, well, what is the structure of this, this higher SSAT basic? Why can't I get out the piece I want? Uh, and it will print out your long list of, okay, well, this is all the stuff that's in that object. Um, and if you need to go there, that's, that's how you do it. But in this case, because it's a little bit more of an accessible object, we can actually use names and you can say, okay, I can say, what are the samples? What's the frequency, HOHS? And you could call on these specifically to make your file. Now, there are also many other ways to calculate FST, as I mentioned. Uh, for example, you can use Weir and Cochrane's estimate, which is available here. We'll give you an overall estimate. You can do pairwise estimates. That's going to take a minute. You can do knees calculation. You can and then you can also do bootstrap. So if you want to make upper and lower limits for your your estimate, you can do that using the boot command. Uh, and you can also set where what level of um, what you want those upper and lower limits to be. So for example, that's taken a little longer. Anybody come up with any questions that they had? I don't see anything in the chat. All right, that's taken too long. Let's just stop it. Okay, so there's the boot and it will produce the upper and lower limits on either side of the uh, the array table there. Now, if you wanted to know what arguments you could pass to this, this boot PF, PPFSD in order to change, for example, the upper and lower limits, you can use the, the command args and that will tell you, okay, it's doing 100 uh, bootstraps by default. The quantiles that it's looking at are the are 0.25 and 0.975. And we're assuming that this is a diploid organism. You can also do a Hardy-Weinberg test that's in there. It, basically, any test that you can come up with, there's probably a package that has been developed in order to do that for you. Okay. So another thing that probably most people will want to do is to calculate an AMOVA to understand how the variance is partitioned across their population. Now, to do this, the first step that you need to do is to set the strata, which is sort of like the grouping. So for here, we for our cows, we can put in... Uh, the species, the country, and the breed. Those are the strata that we can set. Uh, alternatively, because of this package, you can actually just access them with other, which is nice. But this is how you would set them individually if you had a categorical variable that you needed to do that. And then you can also then check to see, well, okay, what, what is the sample size in my, in my strata? And here you can see there's about 50, between 30 and 60 cows in each of those uh, populations. If we are population breeds, uh, you can tell I work with wild species more. Okay, breed, within each of the breeds, uh, you can see how many individuals there are. So you can get an idea of your sample size and evenness when you do that. And then you can use popper to run a MOVA on that. So we will do that here.
And then I'll take a moment. And it reports, okay, well, I didn't find anything over 5%, which is good because we, we, we filtered the data for that. Oh, it's thinking. Let's just stop it for now. All right. So basically from that, you'll see that there's about 12% of the variation is with, uh, between breed, variation within breed, and then within samples. That gives that, but it doesn't give you a, a sense of the statistical significance. For that, you would have to do a RAND test. Now, in this case, a RAND test actually does not work on this data. So, you know, not everything works on all data sets out of the box. Sometimes there's something about the data set that the person who wrote the function doesn't didn't expect. For example, I've had issues where I named my populations with numbers, not letters, and the function was expecting letters. So this kind of thing can cause uh, failures and sometimes failures without any errors. So if you really need to get into uh, to do this RAN test for this data, then what I would do again would be to look at the function and try to figure out what it was, try to get some example data that works and compare it to the data I have and see what might be causing the snag. Um, however, in this cat case, uh, I can run it on the Nancy cat data just to show what you would see. And here is the results of the random test. So you can see what would be expected and where your estimate was. And it will then also print out um, if we do this, print this, it'll tell you what it is and it says, yes, there's the p-value and this is the hypothesis that I was testing. All right. So we've gone over how to get the data in, how to figure out what your data object is and how to play with parts of it, see what is right and maybe if there's something that's wrong or change something. And well, now we can do some basic population statistics. The next step is to do a PCA and a DPCA. Well, we've only been sitting for half an hour, but does anyone need to jump up, ask a question? Anybody have anything? You all look pretty still, you wave. <laughs> Yay, somebody's waving, <laughs> okay. All right, so if there's no questions in the chat here, I think I'll just keep going then. All right, so for a principal component analysis or for discriminant analysis of principal components, the first thing you need to do is to convert your data into the correct, right type of data object. So in this case, the right type, type of data object is a GenLite object. And we can use uh, the package darter, and write that in there, dart r to change it from a, a, a gen individual to a gen light object. And then we can run our PCA analysis, GLPCA on that, those things. We're gonna say, I want to look at um, three principal components. You could have, of course, keep more principal components should you choose to. Uh, and then so we'll do that, it won't take too long. And here we can get the eigen, can just have a glance at the eigenvalues. There's the first five uh, eigenvalues. We can see how much variation is being explained here. And then we can assign the PCA scores to a data frame and then marry that with the data on from the other category for this data. So this gives us the ability to look at those PCA scores based on those different categories. We can also uh, change the names of the uh, cows in this analysis so that the names are displayed correctly. So for example, there's some characters that were left out of the data file in order to make sure that it was parsed correctly. So like the, X, the, uh, the uh, apostrophe and the dash and the accent from the French name have all been left out. However, you can't directly change the vector in this case because the vector is a factor and a factor has set categories. So you can't alter 
the factor uh, because of this setness. So you actually have to change the factor into a character, change the information, and then change it back into a factor. So that's what we do here. Tidy things up a little bit for display. And then here, we're gonna just check to see that it worked. Do we have our names in correctly? That looks like everything's being coming in correctly, good. And we are going to then do our PCA. This is using ggplot2, which is a, a, a popular uh, suite of graphing commands. I find it very non-intuitive, but there are a lot of resources available online and you can get uh, quite good graphics uh, quite quickly out of the box if you can figure out how to get it to work. So here you can see your PCA. We can see that there are two clusters almost uh, with the two different species, the Bose Indicus and the Bose Taurus. Uh, but maybe, so maybe this is good enough. This is, you just are doing some data exploration. You just wanted to see, well, do I have anything going on in this data? Or maybe you want something more along the lines of something you might publish. Um, so for example, maybe we want to put in the breeds into this data. So maybe we take the species and we turn them into different shapes, and then we turn the uh, breeds into different colors. And then we want maybe a legend on this that is better for a publication. So our first step there could be to then choose a better a palette for our different breeds. This is a handy uh, tool for doing that. It has a number of set things that you can change the different uh, levels and the brightness and the type of plot. So here, let's choose a qualitative scale. Let's go for really bright colors. In this case, we know we need 15 of them. So we set that all up. And then we can capture those colors with the PAL command. And then let's make our, our Latin names be in italics so that we can display them in italics with the use of the expression command. And we'll also then set here in the ggplot, we'll shape, set the shapes to be by species and the colors by breed. So here we go, plot that now. And you can see that's getting closer to what you would want for perhaps a publication with the, the, the actual names displayed properly, the two different shapes, distinguishing the two different species and, and whatnot. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Okay. So then if you wanted to save that to a PDF file, that's relatively e easy. You just call it to a PDF. You can set the size of it. Again, here I'm using the paste function in order to marry the name of the, the file that I'm outputting with the outpath that I'm using and the date string that I'm using. And this is just a convenience thing for me so that if I go to work and I'm using computer at work, I can just change the outpath. I don't have to change the path in each individual uh, call. And again, same thing with the date string. The date string is automatically populated with today's date instead of some other date. Uh, so we can do that. And then you can see here what the result of that is. It just prints out to a nice uh, PDF and the, you can scroll in and it's all vectored. So it, it's a nice quality output. So a related analysis would be the discriminant analysis of principal components. And this is a structure-like analysis. Uh, you can see the full tutorial at, at the Addy Jeanette. Uh, web page here that I've referenced in the code. Uh, for this, this is more about not telling it how many clusters there are, but asking it how many clusters seem to explain this data the most, the best. So the way you can start with this is to use the uh, discovery function, like find clusters, which will help you to understand your data here. And in this example, the max clusters was already set to 60. But what will this will do, we'll launch uh, a couple of graphs to say, well, this is what the data looks like. How many PCs would you like to retain? And that would, as they explain in the tutorial, the number of PCs depends on uh, how much data you wanna fit. And then whether you're gonna, you know, if you take too many, you're gonna overfit. If you take too few, you're gonna, you're gonna leave data on the table. So you kind of have to come to an idea, well, where, where is there a good number here where I'm getting most of the data, but I'm not uh, in too much danger of overfitting. So let's just choose 60. And then it will come up and say, okay, well, given that, uh, how many, 
how many uh, clusters do you want to show? And it will give you the BIC value for each of those clusters. So here we go. We've got BIC on the Y axis and number of clusters on, on the X axis. And you can say, well, okay, I think the, the, the lowest number is probably 11. Now, in actuality, you probably want to explore this whole space when you're exploring your data and just see, well, what, what are the results if I put these into this number of clusters? However, this time, let's just pick 11. And then you can uh, populate your uh, call to the DPCA with those, those numbers, or you can actually let it also help you figure out what to do. So then we run that, and then you can look at a summary of the results. This will tell you how many uh, populations, what the probability of assignment was, and the probability of assignment for population, what the prior group size and what the post group size would be in this case. So we can uh, translate that into a bar graph that shows what the probability of assignment uh, to population is. There it is, it's hiding. There you go. So there you can see that the, you've got your breeds on, on this axis and then the, the percent of reassignment to the actual breed here. So you can see that it's not working the great, greatest for some of these breeds in terms of reassignment. And then you can also use a uh, comp plot in order to take that data and make a structure like analysis. If it has time to think anyway. There we go. Okay. So you too can make stripey lines. All right. So any questions on that so far based on what you can see? Okay, well, let's move on to the next section then, the neighbor joining or the unweighted pair group method with aromatic mean trees. Okay, so again, for this type of analysis, we need to have a different type of object. In this case, we need a gen pop object, which summarizes everything by population. So we'll convert our gen ID micro both set into the gen population type. And it says, okay, I did it, which is good. And then we can use the a boot function to create a tree. We're gonna use the provesti distance, which is good for uh, most marker types and it can handle missing data. So it, it's, a, it's a good suitable one for things. And here we're choosing neighbor joining as our type of tree. You could also choose the UPM, UPGMA tree uh, as well. And here this, this value means uh, that we're gonna cut off anything with lower than 80% support. So we can run that or we won't because we're live here and it will take too long. Then once you've done it, uh, you can save that R as an RDS object. And this is particularly important if you are working with a larger a number of taxa. So in this case, because this data set is pretty small, it doesn't take very long to run. Uh, but uh, for example, when I did my work on Kosha, it would take probably an afternoon to run on my laptop. Uh, on the cluster, it didn't take as long, of course, but uh, that is a, this is a good save stage to, to do. And then you can load that back in with the opposite function, the read RDS. And again, here, if you want to uh, change your outdates, uh, old date string to something specific, so you can pull out a file that you, you did before, this is how I do that. So here, you can load that back in again. And again, you can make a PDF pretty easily by calling the PDF. Let's just print it though. Show it. So again, this is the, the tree by default is, yeah. let's just stop that, yeah, I'll go get it. The tree by default isn't particularly beautiful. There's some issues with the overlapping of the numbers and the scale bar has gone over here. So this might not be sufficient for your purposes. Maybe it's fine because you're just doing some data exploration. Um, 
but maybe you want to make it better. Now, uh, the plot philo from the Phi tools package is the command that you want to go to at this point. And there are a number of tutorials online from uh, that the person who made that package uh, have, has put online. And it shows a multitude of things you can do to trees, crazy things you can do to trees. Anything you can imagine you can do to a tree. So um, if you want to, to display data in almost any way, there, there's a way to do it with uh, through these commands. Uh, so first, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how we would color the label, uh, the tips of the two different species here. So I'm just going to manually set those from black to red in terms of their, their color output. And so I can just make that red and maybe I want to make it into a fan instead of a into uh, instead of a cladogram. So here now I have my two other species, the indicus rather than the torix out here in red. And I can do that into a TIFF file. Maybe the journal wants a TIFF file instead of a PDF. And I can set the resolution and the size here. Um, if you're Canadian, you can change this to some centimeters and do it in centimeters. And if you're if you want to be American, you can keep it in inches. Um, you can also ex display a number of variables at the tips. For example, I've made up a pretend milk factor here, so we can put um, a, a milk factor in here. Maybe this is, I mean, I think the example on his, on the, the tutorial is jaw size in lizards. It could be herbicide resistance. It could be anything that you want to quantify in this way. It can be a nice way to display that graphic. Uh, here's another way to do it. You can actually simulate with his tools where he where they think uh, a character state might have changed in uh, the tree based on where which tips have what character state. So here I've made another uh, pretend factor uh, that describes cowiness from really cowy to not particularly cowy. And if I apply that and then create a density map, then we can get a tree that is colored by the the potential for that um, change. So here you can see that there we have a, a, a group that is particularly cowy in this analysis and some other uh, evolutions of really cowiness in our tree. Uh, you can also set the color gradient to your preference. So maybe you don't like the blue and the red, that doesn't seem to work for you. So we want to make it uh, black to gray. So there's, it's pretty much, there's an infinite number of possibilities to what you can do if you're willing to spend the time to do it. Now, say you want to annotate this, like we want to add an arrow to say, uh, I want to draw attention to, to this particular taxa, the Gascon. And maybe you have a picture of your organism that you really want to share with everyone and put that on the tree and say, that is a Gascon cow, here you are. Isn't it wonderful? It's, a, it's not particularly cowy, but there it is. Now, if you're having trouble figuring out how to put that where to put that, like you have to pass it these X and Y coordinates. Um, and that can be a real challenge to say, okay, well, where am I in my picture? You can use the function called locator. And so if you put that in, it'll say, okay, now press on it. And you say, okay, I want the cow picture to be actually up here and up here and you click in the, the, the upper right and the lower left. And then it'll give you the Y coordinates, which you can then put into that call and change the position based on that information. So you're not just hunting around in the dark, trying to guess what the coordinate system might be in your plot. That can save you a lot of time. Okay, and we can also change those tip labels again, because again, um, we don't want to have the names as they were in the data file. We want to have the more correct names with the accents and whatnot. So we can change that here in the tree as well by changing the tip labels. And here, uh, something that I've done often in my trees is I'm going to extract uh, the nodes that are 80 plus uh, support values so that I don't label anything with less support than that. Now, if you wanted to create a nice layout, multi-figure layout with all these different, uh, different graphs in it to make a sort of a composite figure, uh, the the best way I found to do it is with the layout function. Now with the layout function, what you have to do is imagine the space that you are going to be using and imagine uh, boxes within that space. And each of those boxes gets a number and you can express the size and dimension of that box by putting the number uh, one, for example, in, in, that, uh, in that array. So for example, here, I want a square box. So I've got one, it's three by three, 
block of ones beside a three by three block of twos. So I'll have two equal figures up at the top. And then I will have a slightly larger figure in the space called three. Now, if you use zero as a space, then that will remember that will remain as white space, for example. So I could convert this to zeros if I wanted to leave a bigger border of white space and that won't be used. Now, the plotting happens in the order that you've assigned the numbers. So if you wanted to plot this place first and then this place and this place, you just assign this block the number one. So we would do that by setting that matrix. And then we would invoke the layout. So now we have a graphics device where that is the layout that's been invoked. And then we can plot our three trees. There we go. All three of those trees all together in here. And now you can see we have a, a composite figure with our pretend milk, our really cowiness, and our, our fan tree where I've changed the color of cowiness just for fun. Okay. So that pretty much brings me to the end of the parts that I had intended to cover with you today. And it's, it's unfortunate that we didn't have a chance to work through uh, some of the exercises and for you to run the code today. Uh, as I said, I hope we'll be able to distribute this code to you so that you can go through it. And if you want uh, the exercise material that I had put together uh, with the questions that you want to try to answer based on this information, just let me know. I can send that to you as well. Um, the only function that I wanted to show you last is a, is a wellness function that Addie Janet uh, put together. Because as the authors say, uh, sometimes genetic data analysis can be harsh, tiring, and daunting. And sometimes a mere break will not cut it. Sometimes you need a kitten. So here's a command you can run in your R that will launch YouTube and bring up a random cat video. Yeah. And an ad, a random ad. So there's your wellness function for the day. Uh, does anyone have any questions now that they've seen the entirety of that? Hi, Sarah. Todd Gaines here. I just wanted to say uh, that was fantastic. Really, really enjoyed the um, the presentation and the the figures. And I think this is one that, um, like you said, yeah, I hope people can kind of get the examples to work through it because it's such a, uh, yeah, so many cool things that can be done. And I think people, you know, will have the opportunities for their data sets now and in the future. Um, so I just want to say that was great. Thank you. And if anybody in the room has a question, we can uh, pass the microphone around. So we do have a question in the chat here from Ryan Thumb. Uh, can you talk a bit more about how any of this changes when dealing with polyploids from the VCF to the outputs? Oh boy, Ryan, that is a definite topic and it, a lot changes. Uh, my advice is to go carefully through all the manuals and see what applies to polyploids. Um, at this point, I've only worked with diploids, even though I actually have specialized in polyploids uh, in earlier parts in my career. So, I mean, if you want to chat another time, we can uh, we can do that. But uh, I don't have any particular advice for you right now on polyploids, other than uh, seek out the packages that are specifically designed with polyploids in mind, because uh, they will have better uh, support for that.
Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, just a quick question about getting the VCF ready for the analysis. Uh, so what do you recommend it has a filtering like for uh, filtering for LD, filtering for a minor allele frequency? Um, what, do you, what do you recommend all sort of filters that are good for this sort of analysis? And also going back a little bit to the population structure, there is anything that we could use similar to like admixture or in R or something like that? Uh, I don't, I mean, I think struct, the structure-like analysis that the discriminant uh, principal component analysis will do is a, pretty much the closest you can get to a admixture type uh, analysis package. I mean, again, I would say Google that to see if you can find a package that does what you want specifically. Um, I haven't used anything that does that. So I can't say that I have familiarity with anything that does exactly what you're looking at. It could be that Admixture 2 is, is a fairly specialized piece of software, so it hasn't been ported over to R in any way. Um, and then your first question was about filtering. I, I mean, it again, I, it, it varies depending on what your study system is and what you're doing, right? So all I can say is you need to delve into the literature and look at what uh, other people have used for the filtering. But I mean, you mentioned all those things like the minor alleles, the uh, missingness for the data, uh, how uh, the, even the, the coverage, you know, if, of your data could be an important aspect of that. Like how how good quality do you think that data is and through that region of the genome, right? So there's there's plenty of things that you can filter on, and and the tools are there in uh, Popper and Ad, Ad Genet to help you filter your data that way. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about that DPCA analysis. Um, it just seems like very like easier than structure, for example. So I was wondering if you know anything about if reviewers like it, if you can do that instead of using structure and then just do everything in R. Or if you have any, yeah. It's going to depend on your reviewer, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, the kosher paper that we published uh, with the population genetic analysis most recently, they, they didn't have a problem with it. I mean, I think you need to look carefully at what question you're asking and whether it's addressed by uh, the, the, the plots that are made by the column plot function with after the discriminate function or whether it is better suited to the kind of tools that are available in, uh, in structure. Um, Yes, again, like it really depends on your data and, and what you're, you're, you're hoping to achieve. And then, and then yes, on the reviewers in, in particular, so. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. You can try. So that's, uh, I have another question. <laughs> so um, regarding, uh, looking for uh by doing like a genomic scan where you're looking for a, a selection mark uh selection uh footprints within the genome you see all sort of uh, uh parameters that you can use like fst uh pi or like tajimas and um so it's always confused me which one should i use and what situation you would prefer one or the other or like I think there is GSTs too. So, um, so what do you, what do you, uh, what is your opinion about when choose one from the other? And well, so you can do those types of like a Manhattan plots and whatnot. You can do that all in R. Uh, in fact, that would have been that was something that I, I, I cut out of the tutorial at, at an earlier stage just for to make sure that we had enough time to get through everything. Um, and certainly, the parameters that are calculated. Yeah, by R in the packages that we've just gone through, uh, make it possible for you to do that. Uh, now, as to which is preferred, again, like usually I do all the things, right? When I'm doing my analysis, <laughs> as I will look to see what does FST tell me, you know, and and what what do the other parameters tell me? Uh, are they telling me different things? Are they telling me more or less the same thing? You know, like in our one of the analysis we're doing now, you know, everything says, yeah, chromosome four is really important, you know, and so you get a little bit of reassurance to say, okay, doesn't matter which way I do this analysis, I get a, said the same result. And that gives me a hint that maybe I'm on to something for real and not that's pretend in my data, right? And 
I mean, I think, again, I would say go to the literature for your particular species or for in, in your area. Like, I don't, I don't know, are you a weed scientist or, or, or what? But, um, and see what people have done and then, and try to follow, follow their lead there with, I guess the caveat is that it's always good to explore the space and R makes it easy. So just explore, figure out what your data is telling you and then, and then move forward with the information from, from the literature uh, to inform how you would interpret that data.